sweet. Perfect. I'll, I'll meet myself. <laughs> Hello, my name is Carrie. We're here today at Marine Heritage Park for our third park series um, uh, trip. So we're gathered here on uh, this beautiful park. It is a good intersectional place between um, nature and industrial. So you can see that there's a uh, skateboarder too. Um, so here we are at Marine Heritage Park, right here at the Star, off of Holly Street. So if you wanted to get here from Western, you would, here's Western down here, oops, down here. So you would go on North Garden, and then you would turn left onto Holly Street right here, and then you'd end up right where we are here today. All right, let's walk into the trail a little bit um, so we can get out of the noise of the traffic. It's a beautiful scenery here. All right. Sweet. Before we get too much further, uh, well, a little bit further, I want to show the river. So before we get too much further, I'd like to read the land acknowledgement. Um, even though we're gathered here virtually, um, it's still important to acknowledge <clears throat> who this land really belongs to. So I would like to begin by acknowledging that we gather here today on ancestral lands of the coastal Salish people who have lived in the Salish Sea Basin throughout the San Juan Islands and the North Cascade watershed from time immemorial. Please join me in expressing our deepest respect and gratitude for our indigenous neighbors, the Lummi Nation and the Nooksack tribe for their enduring care and protection of our shared land and waterways. So this creek here is Whatcom Creek and it flows from Lake Whatcom into Bellingham Bay. Um, Whatcom in the Lummi uh, language means noisy water. So um, it's a really important little creek for the Lummi Nation. Um, the mouth of this creek was a place where people would dock their boats, their canoes, and camp and fish. So this is an important place for fishing. Uh, for the most part, there's a lot of chum in this river, but there's actually all five salmon, all five uh, Pacific, native Pacific salmon that come up here sometimes. Some of them are by accident, like when pinks come up here, it's usually an accident. But I'd like to give you guys a handy acronym for remembering the five Pacific salmon. So we got Chum thumb. Okay, that's the first one. Chum. Sockeye, because you poke your eye out with your pointer finger. The middle finger is king or chinook because it's the longest finger on most people. Um, the fourth finger, the ring finger, is silver because that's where you put rings. And the pink pinky finger is pink. And conveniently, it's also the smallest fish of the five. Um, there's also two types of native trout that are also part of the same family as those five salmon. And that's bull trout and rainbow trout. And those also swim up this river. Um, they're native to here. <laughs> so um, that's pretty neat. It's a cool place to see some fish. During the fall, there are fish that run up the river, mostly chum, and then you'll see a lot of fishing up there, and we'll talk about that once we walk around this trail. But for now, we'll just keep on walking and seeing what we see. Um, this trail is, has a lot of interpretive signs on different plants, so if you're looking to get into learning about plants, this is a great place to come. Um, 
to take a look for yourself and do some learning. One of my, ooh, there's the train. Hi, train. Also, we have a guest on this video today. This is my roommate, Apollo. Hi. They're a cool skater and a cool person. They love uh, marine fish. And so that's why they came today, because I'd be talking about salmon. <laughs> um, sweet. This is one of my favorite plants that is native to this area. And if you signed into the first park series, we talked about it a little bit. Um, this is snowberry. And in some First Nation languages, it's known as the berry, the Saskatoon berry of the dead. So the white berries are known to be poisonous. So don't eat them. It's really beautiful that's starting to, everything's starting to bloom and you can see that the big leaf maples and the, re and the red alders are sprouting their beautiful leaves. And this tree right here is one of those red alders and it's very indicative um, of riparian zones. They tend to live on floodplains because they only live about five or 50 years. That's like the oldest that these trees get. So they're very common along rivers and they provide a lot of nitrogen for the um, other plants that live in the riparian zone because they have a symbiotic relationship with fungus and um, uh, with the fungus that has a relationship with cyanobacteria that fixes atmospheric nitrogen into uh, usable nitrogen for plants, organic nitrogen. <laughs> and you can see along this river that there's a bunch of logs. Ooh, <laughs> there's baby geese. Uh, uh. They're so cute. Yeah, this is a great place to come and do some bird watching. Um, there's a lot of birds that like to hang out in this part of the river. And because it's such an intersection between the ocean environment and the freshwater environment, sometimes you'll see seals swinging, swimming all the way up, basically to where they can't swim up the rocks anymore. Um, and they tend to do that when the salmon are spawning because they want to eat those salmon because um, they're opportunistic feeders. But little, um, there's a misconception that they eat mostly salmon, but in reality, they eat a lot of squid because it's what they And it's what's available for the night. Uh, eternal feet. Um, right here along the river. Oh, there's the babies. They're so cute. Nice. Along the riverbank here, you can see these some logs, and they're actually chained up. <clears throat> and this is um, this is a part of the restoration project that's been going on on this river. Um, putting logs along the river provides um, essential habitat for salmon and other creatures that live here. Uh, large woody debris is what the, is the name that this is given, which is very indicative of what it is. It's large woody debris. And um, it creates um, little nooks and cr crannies for habitat for juvenile salmon. And it also um, creates a place where sediment can get stuck. And that's really important for the ecosystem as well. So um, recruitment of large woody debris, large woody debris, is one of the many um, restoration tactics used. And you can see right over there, there's some more all along the riverbank. Um, this park is owned by the city of Bellingham and it became a park in, let me get my notes out, sorry. Well, okay, there we go. It became a park in 1982 
and it's protected by the Nooksack Salmon Enhancement Association and the Nooksack Tribe. So that organization, the Nooksack Salmon Enhancement Association, really works hard to ensure that the habitat of Whatcom Creek is habitable for the salmon. So that's like, that's a really important part of this whole park. Um, a little bit more history on this park is that, and history of the river itself, is that it runs four miles from Lake Whatcom to Bellingham Bay. And it's run this path for over 10,000 years. So this river has been here for a substantial amount of time. Um, but what's quite striking is that it's been um, habitated by coastal Salish people for around 8,000 years. So that just goes to show how important it is for our neighbors, the Lummi Nation and the Nooksack tribes. Um, let's see, what else do we got here? Um, in 1852 is when Euro-American pioneers began to develop this area. Um, and in 1953, there was an, uh, a lumber mill that was constructed and it burned down in 1893. So before the lumber mill was constructed, this whole area was wooded. And if it hadn't have been all torn down, maybe it would have been an old growth forest. Um, right here, in particular, it would be mostly deciduous trees as it is now. And that's part of the restoration that the, salmon the Nooksack Salmon Enhancement Association um, has taken a part in, is replanting native trees in the right-hand zone. But um, before the, the logging, there would have been um, coniferous trees, so like Douglas firs, red cedars, um, where all of those buildings are over there. But that being said, um, the restoration has been very successful in recent years. Um, in 1900s to 1984, the river was shaped and melded to meet the needs of urban development. And at one point there was a garbage dump in this area. And in the 70s, there was a sewage treatment plant, which was actually right across the river right there. And since then, um, in, or in 79, 1979, it became a um, hatchery. So it got recycled, upcycled into a hatchery from a, a sewage treatment plant. And now the primary goal of this park is for education. Um, as you can see with the uh, walk, the walk that we're going on, the interpretive walk, and also the hatchery is owned by Belling Bellingham Technical College. So it's kind of a usable source for their, um, for their hatchery sciences so that people can get some hands-on experience. It's pretty neat. We're gonna head up this trail. All along this trail um, that starts at this park, Marine Heritage Park, and goes all the way up towards Wacom Falls, there's art um, focused on salmon. And it's a way to connect the natural world to the um, industrial area that's around it. So really brings to light the importance of salmon for, first of all, the um, indigenous people and to the people now nowadays. Uh, well, for people everywhere now, it's important for everyone. Right here, you can see there is a bunch of thimble berries. These are delicious berries to eat. And once they bloom, they look like little thimbles. And I think the best way to describe their taste is cute. They have a very cute taste. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
here's one of the art pieces along the art trail. Let's go take a look at the interpretive sign. It, it was built to thank um, the Nooksack Salmon Enhancement Organization. And um, yeah, so if you, if you want to learn more about this, you can come, come to the park and read the sign. It's pretty neat. Whew. There's a bunch of rocks with people's names on it too. Donator rocks. Right here you can see this cute little flower, little purple flowers. That, that's called Stinky Bob or, or Herb Roberts. They're actually an invasive weed. So sometimes you'll see people just pulling them out and you can totally do this if you're on a walk and you see some, just pull it out and put it on the sidewalk or the trail. Um, and it's a good way to just kind of help keep up the native species in the area. Because they can really take over the, that's all Herb Robert or Stinky Bob in there. Right here, you can see a big leaf maple that's popping up. And I just learned that you can eat the flowers of, of um, big leaf maples and you can put them in like pancakes. And apparently they're really tasty. So you're looking for some foraging to do. Here's some more art. So cool. We got some metal salmon. So what's so fun about this trail, it's like a scavenger hunt to find the art. It's so uh, interwoven into the natural environment. Can you spot the salmon? Very cute. <clears throat> Here's another one of those impeding invasive species that's encroaching on this beautiful native environment. Um, this is Himalayan blackberry. It's got five leaves. There's some tasty berries that come out of these plants, but you can really see how they take over. They can take over a whole landscape. This is a really cool trail to come on. It's very accessible, it's wheelchair accessible, um, and it's a fun little walk. You get to learn a lot. And on the Bellingham, the City of Bellingham website, if you search Marine Heritage Park, there's a link to a field guide that you print out, and it's really fun for kids and adults to come to this park and try to answer the questions. It's mostly based around salmon ecology and can be a really fun learning experience, experience for people um, to learn in the field by, their, by themselves. And then you can, you can fact check your answers. So it's a fun thing to try out. Here's another cool native plant that is right along the river. You can hear it's getting pretty loud with the river. Um, but this is called a salmon berry. It has little purple flowers. And when the berries come out, they are kind of a tan, tannish pinkish berry. And they've got pretty big seeds, but they're really yummy. And this was another berry that was eaten by um, coastal Salish people. It's a yummy one.
here's a cool bridge that you can cross and to over the river, see over the river. It's quite pretty. It's amazing to think of the salmon and how they can swim up this river. They go from pool to pool. Um, like maybe over there, you can see that there's kind of a ladder that formed. They would be able to jump up from pool to pool. Um, the highest that any salmon can jump is around, I think, 15 feet. But that's like, that's only certain types and it depends on the individual salmon as well. So it's pretty amazing that they're able to get up this river. It's the, this river is such an interesting intersection between um, development and nature and the kind of nature that we associate with nature in, in Western society because there's a road right up there. And yet along this river, there's plenty of foliage to create um, shade to keep the water nice and cold for the salmon. And that just goes to show how much work has been put in to restore this river. On June 10th, 1999, there was a gas line pipeline operated by Olympic Pipeline that passed over Whatcom Creek um, and it split a seam and dumped uh, 230,000 gallons of oil into the creek. Um, it was very devastating for not only the environment, but for the community in Bellingham, because um, when this happened, there was an 18 year old who was fly fishing um, and he was drowned. He got drowned by the oil. And then there were also two 10 year old boys who were playing with fireworks and they actually caught the, the oil explode and they both they both tragically burned to death. And one of them was named Wade King. And that's where the name for the recreation center at Western comes from. Um, so next time you go to the recreation center when we're able to remember Wade King and the two other boys that got caught in that pipeline explosion and how tragic that was for the community and, and for the East Zone here um, at Whatcom Creek. But thinking about how devastating that was for the ecosystem, a whole bunch of gas coming down and burning everything on the sides of the rivers. Um, it's quite amazing that in just 21 years, basically 20, 21 years, um, the river has been able, the restoration projects have been able to restore the riparian zone, which is the zone <clears throat> along the river. So the whole, the terrestrial and um, water ecosystem of the river has been able to be restored and there are some healthy runs of salmon now. These are some of the holding tanks for the fish, for the hatchery here um, along Whatcom Creek. <clears throat> and um, I don't know exactly what these tanks are used for specifically, but um, as you can see, there's a van for Indian tribes working for tomorrow's fish today. So it's one of the organizations that has, that works here and make sure that these fish are being brought up and put it into the river. And just for a clarif clarif 
I didn't know the difference between a hatchery and a fishery until I took a class on salmon um, and trout in the Pacific Northwest. So a hatchery is when people actively um, basically create fish by um, by uh, artificial um, means like is going on here to enhance the populations of salmon in places where there's not enough salmon because of reasons such as overfishing and um, hy hydroelectric um, and stuff like that. Um, whereas a fishery is simply just a place where people can fish can also mean a place where people can um, fish for clams or oysters or whatever kind of um, uh, marine animal. There's another part of this hatchery. It's quite interesting. The politics of hatcheries are interesting to me because there are pros and cons to having hatcheries because we're, um, while they can be very beneficial for um, supplementing the population when it is suffering for various types of salmon and trout, um, if they are used for a long time, they can actually diminish the fitness of the overall um, community of salmon because they can interbreed with the native salmon the wild salmon that is. It's interesting to think about the pros and cons and make sure that people are treating the ecosystem correctly, but they can be managed in a holistic way that is beneficial for the ecosystem. And I believe that this is one of those hatcheries that is managed in that way. Um, this hatchery, is for chum salmon. So that's the one that was on the thumb. And salmon are pretty hard to identify, especially when they're in their ocean phase. So when they're coming up this river, they're going from ocean phase to the, river, to the uh, spawning phase of their life. And they go through a process called desmultification. And that comes from this, the word smultification that refers to the process of going from river to ocean. And it's an interesting process for fish because it means that they're going from fresh water to salt water and then which changes how they take water and um, nutrients. So it's quite interesting when they when they come up from the ocean they they're like all salmon look very similar when they're in the ocean they're all pretty silver and they're hard to distinguish from each other um but as they come up they start to go through changes and for chums what they tend to look like when they're in their spawning phase is they have like an olive, olive background um, with red vertical stripes. They're not complete stripes, but um, yeah, if you look up a picture of them, they look pretty cool. Um, and during that phase, the spawning phase is the best way to identify them from each other. Right here, this is a collection tube for chums. And they say that you can put chum salmon in here um, while you're fishing here and um, they will go to the hatchery holding tanks so that they can be used to um, so that their um, seed and their eggs so can be used to make more salmon. So the more chum that get put in this the more genetic diversity there will be so it's advantageous to get as many salmon through this as possible um, so that they will be they will have the most genes to pick from. Um, that's one of the issues with um, hatchery fish. One of the, thing that, the things that's hardest to get um, 
one one of the things that is hard to get as it would be in nature is <clears throat> such a broad genetic um, diversity that's in nature. Uh, and when there's less genes to pick from, it means that the fitness of the overall population will be lower. So it's pretty fun to come out here and watch people fish. It's a type of fishing people like to call combat fishing. So picture this whole this whole um, fence as a file of people with their fishing lines in the river. There's so much risk, people getting their lines tangled together. And it's fun to watch them because if somebody all the way up there catches a fish, they'll have to yell, fish on, fish on. And then they start running all the way down here. Then they end up over here and they try to get the fish up. And they try to figure out what it is, make sure that it's legal, make sure they can keep it. Um, so I highly recommend coming and watching that. It's typically open from August 1st to December 31st. Um, but in the past few years, they have had to close it early. So this year they closed it on, on in 2019, they closed it on November 15th. In 2018, November 15th. Um, so it's a bummer that they've been having to close it early because that means that um, um, so, and people at the hatcheries are worried about how many fish are coming back uh, because there's not enough coming back up. It's not the same number as it used to be. Um, so, but it's good that, um, so that those populations can recover. And yeah, if you're interested in fishing here in um, the fall, make sure that you look up all the regulations. Don't take my word for any of the regulations. I just did a quick Google search, search but make sure that you go to the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife um, because they'll tell you all the regulations for the year that you go. Um, as far as I know, you can keep two fish a day. So that's quite a bit of fish. Um, yeah, make sure you get a license and you look up all the regulations because those regulations are there for a reason. And we want to make sure that we, you know, abide by those so that the salmon populations can continue to grow and be sustainable. Um, a little bit more nerding out about fish. Um, most salmon are semiparous, which means that they swim up the river and they spawn and then they die. So they have one brood of fish and then they die. Uh, trout tend to be able to do that multiple times. Um, and some types of salmon do, but most of them can only do it once. Um, and the overall family of the Pacific salmon, which include the five, Chum, chum thumb, sockeye, king, silver, and kink, plus the two trout, which is um, bull trout and rainbow trout. And all seven of those are part of the Oncorhynchus family, which I think is a fun name, Oncorhynchus. Here's a bunch of dandelions. Let's see. Something else that's uh, specific to chum salmon, which is uh, the primary salmon to this river, is that they spawn after they go into the ocean. They come back after three to five years. And um, that's something that's different for each kind of salmon. For example, pink salmon, which are the small ones, they come back every two years and it's very, it's always um, very predictable. So. There'll be one run of salmon that'll come back on even years, and then sometimes there'll be another run of pinks that come back on odd years. Um, but I don't think there's any, I don't think pink salmon are very um, common on this river. Um, usually when they do come here, it's by accident. 
Something else that's really interesting about salmon is that is the way that they are able to figure out how to get back to where they spawned, where where they were born, because they always come back to the same river that they were born at. So while they're in the ocean, they use magnetic forces. I'm not sure exactly the um, physiological process that they use, but they, it's more of a magnetic field thing in their brain. But once they get close to the river, they actually use smell. So they can smell the sediment composition of their spawning, of the spawning ground they're aiming to go back to. Um, and that's something else, something that's um, detrimental when there's a dam that's put in place because it inhibits um, sediment to come down to the ocean. So it makes it harder for salmon to smell they're from. It's a seagull. Yeah, there's, I see those, those fish hopping. Yeah, me too. Don't know what kind of fish those are. But they're cute. Uh -uh. In two weeks, we're gonna have another um, park series where we're gonna discover Whatcom Creek Falls Park. And um, it's really cool because there's a trail that you can walk from this park, Marine Heritage Park, all the way up Whatcom Creek to get all the way to Whatcom Falls Park. So um, if you're interested in that, you can walk from the ocean all the way up to some waterfalls and it's a really beautiful way to kind of see the whole scope of um, our natural environment that we have here in Bellingham. Such interesting intersectionality. So cool. There's some more of that large woody debris. Look at those ducks or seagulls and then maybe one duck. I don't know what that little guy is. She goes. Oh, that guy's so cute. Here's another one of those arts, um, the art on this walk. Uh, if you're interested in this art, highly recommend going onto the Bellingham City website and um, looking up this park. And there's a whole link to the whole art walk um, that you can read about each piece and um, get a greater understanding of its meaning and purpose. Sweet. We've got 15 more minutes. Well, let's go ahead and head over to Waypoint Park, which is right across the street. And th that way we can kind of take a look at the um, the mouth of the Whatcom Creek. Important seal habitat. Important seal Very habitat. important seal habitat. That's where all of the seals of the Bellingham Bay area go and haul out. It's where they sleep and there's no more territory for them to do that. Interesting fact. Sure is. <laughs> Just look at the river. Oh, it's a baby duck. Oh, there's the geese. The baby geese. I don't know if you can see it very well in the video, but 
quite cute. Cute. This is a cute tree. I don't know what it's called exactly, but it's part of the pea family. Looks like a firework. Yeah, let's look at this map really quick. I wanna show you guys how you can get to Whatcom Falls from here. So here we are again, we just made a loop um, around Maritime Heritage Park. Um, but when we turned left to go on that bridge, that's like right here, you could have just kept going and then you just keep going on this trail. And then at this intersection, you would go left and you would just keep following the trail. Oh, we're... yeah. There's a lot of good Here's a bigger picture. All right, let's go towards the park. Make sure we look both ways. <laughs> yeah, we're crossing out a crosswalk. <laughs> Here's the opening of the creek into the ocean. So it's such an interesting part of the river ecosystem because while the river is flowing outwards towards the ocean, the ocean, well, in this case, the sound or the Salish Sea, it has tides. So the, not only does the flow of the river, but also the tides affects how the river flows. So oftentimes when juvenile salmon are making their way down the river, uh, they get a little bit confused in the tidal flats because um, they're used to having a river that only flows one direction and then they start to experience tides um, and it's hard to know exactly which direction is towards the ocean when the tides are pushing you up river so it's pretty interesting here we're coming to Whoops. Here we're coming up to Waypoint Park. <clears throat> this park has also undergone extensive restoration in the past few years. Um, it's been historically a very polluted waterway. Uh, we're going to cross. Sweet. <laughs> Yeah, so this, it's been historically a very polluted waterway, um, but it's been very well restored lately. And it's been made to be a pretty little beach here. Um, it's got this interesting acid ball art piece. If you've ever come here before, you've probably wondered, what the heck is that thing? Um, it turns out it was originally used in wood pulp processing. So it's a way to kind of decompose the wood to make it into pulp for paper. Huh? You said this was a paper mill? No, yeah, this used to be a paper mill here. So that's why there's all this industrial looking stuff, but it's no longer used. It just kind of looks like creepy and ominous. I think it's kind of cool. That's actually why the seals used to haul out here. The paper mill had all the logs for processing and they would sit in the in the creek in what's called log booms and that's where the seals would haul out. But since the the waterway has been restored, they've removed those logs, removing the seal habitat. Oh, that's yeah, really so the restoration is is a is a there's a trade-off there for sure. Huh. Are they able to haul out on these no, rocks? No, because it's too, it's too populated down here, and they've been hauling out on those logs for so long. Hmm. 
I used to observe the seals, and uh, I only saw one hauled out on this beach once. Whoa, dang. That's so interesting. So the seals kind of figured out how to mold to like the industrial place that they yeah. were, and then and then it got taken away. Yeah, exactly. Whoa. Uh, and there's not a lot of coastline because of all the industrial, like all the urban development that we've done around here for them to dang. haul out on now. That's super interesting. This is Waypoint Park, it's super cute. There's a super fun little um, park place, a little place to um, play on the stuff, playground. Um, there's, whoa! <laughs> I just fell, I'm fine. <laughs> Are you okay? <laughs> Yes, I'm fine. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, be careful of those stairs. They'll get you. <laughs> um, another great part of this park <laughs> is the pump track. If you're into BMXing or mountain biking, this is a great place to come and refine your skills. Find your skills. Unfortunately, it is closed right now due to COVID. Um, it's too, it gets too populated when it's open. So people will probably won't be able to uh, keep up with the six feet rule. But it's also um, closed after it rains. So please don't come out here right after it rains because it erodes it and then uh, nobody can use it when that happens. But it's super fun. Highly recommend if you're um wanting to get into any of those sports it's a fun place to come try it out um yeah and if you keep walking down that way you'll get to what i like to call trash beach and i don't know what the actual name of it is but um it's another industrial little beach beach that has a whole bunch of beach glass so if you're interested in finding beach glass and maybe making it into something or just having it it's a great place to go all right and that's all that I have for you today for our third Bellingham uh, park series um, we went to marine heritage and Waypoint Park and I hope that you all learned a little bit and you know have have fun out there get outside uh, make sure that you stay safe um, if you think that you're going to be in a populated place bring a face mask you know take all those precautions uh, wash your hands yep all right thanks everybody bye